Hello and welcome to the Business Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Holly Wharton. I've been an entrepreneur since 1999 and I know firsthand how difficult it can be to build a business without the right mindset. This is a podcast for those of us who struggle with showing up in our business with confidence and authenticity, who resist taking big action because of fears and doubts, who know deep down that it's possible to create something bigger and yet you're not. This podcast combines powerful strategies on how to upgrade your business mindset along with practical business tips to grow your business more easily in a way that feels aligned. This podcast features solo shows with me and also interviews with inspiring women entrepreneurs from around the world, including my monthly co-hosted episodes with Joe Casey. My goal is to help you grow your business more quickly and easily by transforming your mindset. For me, mindset work is a lifelong practice, and I want to help you make a habit out of mindset work. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, let's get into this week's episode. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Business Mindset Podcast, episode 242. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm back with another co-hosted episode with the fabulous Joe Casey. Today, we talk about the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. Now, you've probably noticed that Joe and I are huge fans of the MBTI, But did you know that Jo has actually trained in this extensively? And she used to facilitate evaluations as part of her pre-business professional life. In this episode, we talk about why the MBTI is so important and how it's useful to business owners. Jo also does a full rundown of my own profile while at the same time helping you to find your own. This is super genius how she does this. The way she describes each type is really, really interesting. And even though I've known my own type for years, probably 15 years or so, I learned so much from this episode, and you will too. Here's what you're going to learn. We talk about what exactly are psychometric tests and why they're so useful, why certain things come easy to you and why you struggle with others, how the Myers-Briggs type indicator can help you find your zone of genius and your ideal clients how it can help you discover how to best structure your workday, why it is so much more than just what you get from an online quiz or your four little letters that we so identify with, some of us, and how to get clear on what comes most naturally to you. This is such a great episode. It's a longer episode than usual, but it's packed full of really useful and really practical information that will help you find your own type And more importantly, understand your type. So even if you already know what your four letters are, this will help you understand that profile at a much deeper level. And I am all about getting to know ourselves. I love this stuff. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I do. We had so much fun recording it and I learned so, so much. So let's get started. Hey, Joe. Hi, Holly. I'm so excited about our episode today. Me too. So today we're going to talk about everything you ever wanted to know about MBTI. What is that? It's the Myers-Briggs type T- indicator. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is it's the Myers-Briggs thingy that I love. <laughs> I love it when I'm reading someone's bio on Twitter or online somewhere and they say they're an INFJ or, you know, whatever their thing is, because I instantly feel a connection with them. It's four stupid little letters, but I get so excited about it. So today we're going to talk about what this is, why you should be interested in it if you've never heard of it, how you can use it in your business, how you can use it to help your life and business be more aligned. And if you're a skeptic and you think all this stuff is a bunch of BS, why perhaps you might want to open your mind and let a little bit of Myers-Briggs love into your life. So that's what we're talking about today. So Joe, I'm going to pass it over to you because you are the expert on this stuff. Yay, I get to talk MBTI. So um, yeah, I am very nerdy when it comes to MBTI. I, I love it. And so so my, my, my background, my kind of like day job background in the days when I used to work in an office and and stuff like that was in learning and development, human resources, organizational development, that, that type of area. And I would 
it, it, it's kind of viewed as the, the science of helping people to do better in, in, in their jobs or do the best in, in their jobs. And as part of that, I, um, I was trained, sent off on training courses on a number of psychometric tools. So for those of you who have ever been for those horrible types of job interview where they sit you in a room and make you do a test, it was someone like me who was administering those tests. And I'm, and so I'm, I'm qualified in a number of them. Some of them are things that measure your ability in something. And others are ones that measure your, your personality, those kind of um, less less tangible things in a way. And to be honest, I am fairly indifferent about most of them. I have um, I have qualms and questions about a number of them, apart from MBTI. And the mm. reason that I like the Myers-Briggs type indicator is it fits so well with the kind of the, the ethics and values of, of coaching and about respecting the individual. And what MBTI looks at is your personality type, meaning the most natural, easiest way you find of doing certain things. And so it's not about ability, which already means that it, it, it doesn't deal with, oh, you will be good at this, but you're not so good at that. It, it's, it doesn't work like that. It's all about, you will find it easiest and most comfortable to behave like this. And you tend to find it less comfortable when you're required to behave like that. And so it's not about judging people or um, about uh, ability. It's not about strengths. It's about what is your most natural and comfortable way of being in the world. I also like it because it's not a done to process. It's a, it, it's very subjective. Um, and it kind of brings together the science and the research with your own perception of yourself. And so that to me means that it's also very respectful. So it's not about a computer or a psychologist saying, Oh, you're like this. Mm. You get to decide from the descriptions and from the options what you think you f is a best fit for you. So it works in, in two ways. Like a lot of psychometrics, you'll go and you'll do um, an online test or it used to be a paper questionnaire. You spend hours scoring these paper questionnaires. <laughs> um, they're all done by a computer now. And very often it'll come out and it'll say, you are this. And it will give you a, you know, a, a, a type or a label or something like that. And it can feel very done too. Whereas with MBTI, it's done in two parts. Yes, there is an online test. And there are, there are many that are available, um, free on the internet. They are not a hundred percent accurate, but then no psychometric test ever is. So don't worry too much about that. But that's only part of it. That online part that, that, you know, doing the questionnaire, answering the questions, that's only half of it. The other half is done in consultation with a consultant, somebody like me, who takes you through each of the areas and then you get to decide which in your opinion is the best fit for you and that's ultimately decides on on your type and I really like that so it's it's not a question of some very clever person comes along and tells you what you are and what you're good at um, it's not that at all it's it you decide which is the best fit for you and I, I like that approach Mm, I love that. So what kind of training do you have to do in order to be an MBTI facilitator? Because there's a lot of information here and there's a lot of different perspectives and there's a lot of different kind of personality types. There, there are. So the first thing that you have to do, well, certainly in, in the, the UK, I don't know how it, how it operates in, in other countries, but certainly in the UK, you have to do, I think it's a four or five day. I'm trying to blank a lot of it out. Um It's kind of a level one psychometric testing qualification with the British Psychological uh, society mm. and it's basically five days of statistics which mm -hmm. if any of you know anything about me at all <laughs> but that is not my natural um most comfortable place it was hard <laughs> it was one of the <laughs> hardest pieces of training i have ever done so it's it's um uh, you know reading into you know population curves and uh psychological 
um, backgrounds, but an awful lot of it is to do with uh, statistics um, because psychometric tests are developed by analysing the, the the data and, and kind of features and behaviours of thousands of people. And so you need to have a good grasp of, of stats to understand how the psychometrics are put together. Thankfully, once you've done that, you never really have to do it again because now the computer does it all for you. But you have to do like a week of of stats. And then you do a second, um, I think it's three, it might be four days for, for MBTI part one, which is all about the, the test itself and what it's based on and uh, the kind of the, the history and the background and how it's been developed. And then there's also a part two that you can go on and do. So there's MBTI type one, which is what we're going to be talking about today. There's also a part two, which I'm also qualified in, which is another, I think, three or four days training course. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite intensive to to go and and and, and do the training. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I I in, it, you know, it really feeds my nerdy side. <laughs> <laughs> so I really like it. <laughs> well, it sounds like there's a lot of science behind it, yeah. which I think a mm-hmm. lot of people don't understand. Mm-hmm. And I I love quizzes and personality tests and I love this kind of thing. So I'm naturally drawn to these things and I love MBTI. But there are a lot of people who are skeptic online and they say, you know, it's just a bunch of BS. It means nothing. Like it's, it's just like a horoscope kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So how would you answer those people and how would you suggest that perhaps they open their minds up to the possibility of taking a look at their type? Well, I think first of all that there is this, this misconception which is quite often put about by people who don't fully understand the the, the process. So one of the, the benefits of having the internet is there are lots of MBTI type tests that you can do for free on there, which is great. I think it's fantastic the information is disseminated, but it also means that there is not the full understanding of what the the background of it is what the purpose of it is, what the approach of it. And so people think, when people kind of push back about gets MBTI, the, the things I hear most often are, oh, it's just putting people in a box and it's not scientifically rigorous. Well, it's not putting people in a box. It's based on Jung's theory of personality type. And it is a theory. So... But, you know, it's it's a theory that has an awful lot of research behind it. So Carl Jung, psychologist working, um, psychiatrist, sorry, working at around the same time as um, Freud, is, you know, often regarded as, as one of the two kind of founding fathers of modern day psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas Freud dealt a lot with the subconscious, the theory of the subconscious, um, what Jung was really interested in is that we we are born a certain type. There are different types of people and we don't change from that. Um, now, I think science has kind of, rec- or certainly kind of modern modern psychology and psychotherapy has, has, has recognised that it's not quite as simple as that. Mm-hmm. That whereas we may have certain things about our personalities that are fixed, there are also certain parts of our personality which are, are more fluid and, and can develop and can change over time. Um, but it is, I think, fairly true to say that, you know, that you do get people who are um, more introverted and people who are less introverted, <laughs> more extroverted. Is true to say that some people are just naturally more um, comfortable with things like data and numbers and uh, right and wrong and, and have a way of looking at the world that is 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 more kind of black and white, yes or no. Whereas for other people, there is many more shades shades of grey. I think we also know this ourselves instinctively because we know that we meet some people we kind of click with and we can kind of, oh yeah, I, I can relate to them. It's like we talk the same language, even though you may literally be talking the same language, say talking English or... Um, <laughs> But then there's other people who you meet and you kind of go, they are like an alien. I just don't understand where you're coming from. Yes. And so one of the the things that that Jung was really interested in was, well, if we can kind of analyze and and, and help people understand what their their type is, then they can um, feel more comfortable in the world. They can start fighting against their natural instincts and their most natural way of doing things. And 
start to to lean into and play to those strengths um and also do things like you know find work um that is going to be much more fulfilling to them and ways of working that's going to be much more fulfilling to them and ways of relating to others that are going to be much more successful and fulfilling to them than if they're constantly fighting against their type Mm. Um, so this makes sense within a corporate environment, obviously, because you're working mm-hmm. with a bunch of different people mm-hmm. and you've all kind of got to get along and get stuff done. Mm-hmm. Why is this so important for the solopreneur or the entrepreneur? Oh, loads of reasons. First of all, <laughs> um, so the Myers-Briggs type indicator was developed based on Jung's work, but was developed by mother and daughter. Um, round about the time oh. of the Second World War. I, I, honestly, I, w- I will answer your question in, in a moment, but th- this is really helpful context. And um, uh, I think it was the, oh, this is the mother. I can never remember whether it's um, uh, Myers or Briggs. Anyway, she, it was part of her role was to assign roles to servicemen in the US Army who had signed up during the Second World War. And she was interested in Jung's work and thought, well, wouldn't it be, rather than kind of randomly assigning people, wouldn't it be good if we could say take the people who were great at numbers and put them into something that dealt with numbers and wouldn't it be great if we could take the the natural healers of the world and put them in the the medic team and we, so she was already thinking of applications for for Jung's work and then over the course of I think it was 20 years it took her and her daughter working on looking at different job roles and kind of through the prism of, of Jung's personality types to about what would be good roles for the different personality types. And that's how the Myers-Briggs type indicator was initially uh, developed. Mm. So as a solopreneur, you will have already realised that there are some parts of your role that you love to do. <laughs> and there are some parts of your role that you don't love to do. But as a solopreneur, you kind of have to do them all until you're at the stage where you can outsource so you can get help. There are also lots of different ways that you can run your business. So, for example, you know, we talk about this 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 quite a lot about you know what feels right to you. Um, and one of the beautiful things about knowing your Myers Briggs type is that it gives you such insight into why certain things feel good for you to do and certain things just feel like oh I got I got it takes so much energy, and because it's not about whether you can do something it's not about ability it's about what is going to come easiest to you it can help to guide you along those lines of well this is where i may need some help with and this is where i'm really going to shine this is going to be much more likely part of my zone of genius can also really help with what type of clients you want to work with because some of the types get on really well some of the types don't. They, t- they tend to clash, not because they're horrible people, but just because they have different ways of looking at the world and different ways of doing things. So I've talked quite a lot about how the fact that I'm not one of life's very organised people, but I love being creative. I love that kind of being in the moment. I need help with the side of my business, which is about forward planning and staying on track and doing things like, you know, the counts and stuff like that. Yeah. Because that's not my natural way of doing things and so those things don't come easy to me it's not that i can't do them i can learn to do them but it's not in my zone of genius and so knowing that about myself first of all stops it stops you having that kind of real harsh self-judgment oh my goodness i can't why can't i i get straight with the numbers i'm a terrible business person i will never be able to do that once you understand that actually it's not part of your your kind of know your natural style to find those things easy then you can take away that layer of self-recrimination and you can decide oh okay it's probably going to take me longer to learn those things and say somebody who is really good and really adept with with numbers so i have hmm. a choice i either allocate myself more time or that might be something i want to look at getting some help with so it's it's kind of double barreled it helps you to work more within your zone of genius and i I, i'm a huge believer in that we you know that that's where we get the most that's where we achieve the most and that's also what where we fly where you know Mm. where we hit those points of oh i could do this all day yeah and it takes away some of that self-judgment but for the skeptics this isn't about 
oh, you won't be any good at numbers because you're such and such a type. It's about, it's probably going to take me longer because that's not my natural way of doing things. I could still do it if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So it's not about putting yourself in some rigid box. And it's also not about giving yourself an excuse not to do things. Yeah, I think that's really, really important. Like, I can't do this because I'm, Mm -hmm. you know, such and such type. Yeah, exactly. So if I said to myself, okay, I'm not, uh, I know myself well enough to know that I'm not one of life's really organized people. Therefore, I won't worry about paying my taxes because, you know, that's just not within my, my thing to do. You know, the inland revenue <laughs> don't look kindly on that. They they don't accept that as an excuse. I, I have to find a way of doing it, but now I have more information about how I can make that, that easier on myself. Does that make sense? Am I explaining yeah, that well? Yeah, it does, definitely. Um, so, for example, another one that, that comes up is introversion and extroversion. So whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, and, and Myers Briggs talks about um, uh, introversion and extroversion in a, a slightly different way than a lot of people, uh, the, the kind of the, the modern terminology would call. So we, we generally think of extroversion as being very outgoing, very personable, loves chatting to people, loves being center of attention. And introversion being very quiet, very shy, don't like being with people. That's not actually what we we look at when we're talking about within a Myers Briggs um, a, a context. Mm-hmm. We look at where your energy comes from. Yes. So I think, uh, uh, and this is a big one that people got. Well, I did that test and it said that I'm an, uh, an introvert, but I love talking to people. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm an introvert and I love talking to people too, but. The difference is for an introvert, talking to people takes energy. Whereas for an extrovert, talking to people or spending time with people gives you energy, gives Mm -hmm. you fuel. And so as an introvert, it helps me to manage my energy by knowing, okay, if I've got lots of client calls on or if I'm running a workshop or I'm doing a webinar or something like that, or I've got a party that I'm going to, I'm going to need some downtime at some point so I can recharge. Yes. That was a massive reframe for me when I learned that. There's nothing wrong with you. And so that's the big thing I I want everyone to take away from Myers-Briggs. There's nothing wrong with you. With (laughs) any of it, there's no right or wrong. There's no one type that is regarded to be better than another. Even the kind of the guidelines that you'll find online are just guidelines. Even when Jung was doing this, it wasn't like, oh, if you're this type, then you should be a doctor or you should be a certain profession. It's not. It's just a guideline. It's just information. So it's not about putting you in a box. It's about giving you some additional insight into yourself. It's not absolute. It's not 100% because no psychometric ever is. When Jung was first working, he and actually when the, the Myers-Briggs type indicator part one was first developed, it was very much around, you are this type, you cannot move out of this type. Mm-hmm. So on the analogies is, if you live a, at the very south coast of England, you are st- which may only be, what, 25 miles away from the coast of France, you are still English, you are not French. <laughs> You are still part of the United Kingdom, even though you're hundreds of miles from like uh, Wales and Scotland, mm. but you're still English. You are not French. So that was, it's very rigid. Once you're that type, you're that type. Mm-hmm. The Myers-Briggs type two indicator is much more of what they call a trait test. What they realize is actually we, ha- we have areas of kind of, um, wiggle around the edges. So yeah, maybe occasionally there's part of you that maybe is a bit French. But, you know, mainly you're English, but you've got this tiny bit of you that is kind of Parisian or something, you know. So it's, mm. it's not as, as rigid. It does recognize that you can be an introvert, but you've got the odd extrovert tendency. It's much it's much more fluid. So view it as a guideline. Mm-hmm. But it is a fantastic way of gaining insight into yourself, into why you find some things really easy and enjoyable and comfortable to do and why you find some things more difficult and it's not because you're crap or you're useless or you're not cut out for this it's just because that's not within your your kind of natural inclination to do it doesn't mean you can't learn how to do it yeah i think that's a really important thing Mm -hmm. to point out so um 
what we thought we would do um yay because holly was really excited about this on our our, our last <laughs> podcast we, we we talked about this and i said oh, i will do um a feedback session for you on your your mbci type holly and holly said well how would this be interesting for other people to listen to and one of the great things about uh mbti as i say the the kind of the online test is only part of it and if you want to pause the podcast now and you can go to uh 16 personalities uh is it dot com yeah so it's mm-hmm. one six kind of the digit one six personalities dot com and they have a free uh myers briggs type test that you can do like i say it's not 100 percent accurate but none of them are you can go and do that and then come back but and it, go on sorry it, it, it is fairly oh i mean obviously nothing's 100 percent accurate but i probably first heard about myers briggs 15 years ago and i've done several online tests over the course of the years mm-hmm throughout different stages of my life when I've changed a lot and the result has always been the same and I've used different websites. So I think it can be very accurate. Mm. Yeah, I mean, they are. It's, it's, I think if you do want one of these ones, to me, they're about 99.5% accurate. But mm-hmm. the, if you did the official Myers-Briggs test through their website or through one of their, their resellers' websites, it's still only 99.5% yeah. accurate, you know? So... But as I said earlier, that's only part of, of this, this puzzle. And so the, the second part is a feedback session like this. And this is where you can play along at home. <laughs> Yay. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead Holly through the, the, um, the different dimensions. So Myers Briggs is broken into, down into four areas and each of those areas has uh, it can be one or the other so there's actually eight different things that that we look at and i'm going to describe each one and give some examples and then ask holly which she thinks based on what i've told her and her own experience uh she thinks is the best fit for her and so you can do this while you're you're listening so you can do your very own mbti um feedback session listening along to this because you will also be able to make that decision based on on what i i lead you through so um do you want yeah. to dive in yeah yeah okay. let's get started i'm so excited okay so i've told you a, a bit of the the um the, the background and the history of of mbti the way that we approach it is it looks at preference preferences rather than ability Mm -hmm. and so what i want you to do and you can do this at home but please don't do it if you're driving (laughs) (laughs) or running on a treadmill or operating or anything like that or any operating heavy machine or anything like that if you're like just sat and you can put down whatever you're doing for for a moment and and it's safe i just want you to fold your arms just how you would naturally normally fold your arms okay so if i do it uh my left arm goes over my my right arm Mm-hmm. now when you do that how how does it feel comfortable yeah it's kind of usually your, your arm just knows what to do it's, it's kind of easy it's comfortable you don't really have to think about it it's kind of automatic what i want you to do now is i want you to fold them the opposite way so if uh, with me it was my left arm goes on top my right arm's gonna have to go on top and it's like oh um oh i'm not sure where my wrong. hands go yeah <laughs> <laughs> so how does that feel uncomfortable it feels weird yeah and how easy was it to do very easy to do but uh actually no you're right so i kind of i got the right arm on top but then the left arm it kind of didn't want to come up the other side so yeah yeah, it was awkward so for most of us it's the type of thing that we can still do it but we have to think about it. it just takes more energy so it's not that you can't do it it's just that it takes some additional thought and more effort. And that's the perfect analogy for what we're talking about when it comes to preferences in with MBTI. So it's not that you can't do the, the, the things that are out of preference. It's just that it's way easier and takes less energy to do the things that are in preference. Mm. So that's a- I, I didn't have to think about it the first time. Mm-hmm. I did have to like look at my arms to do it the second time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So another way that we sometimes illustrate this is you, we get somebody to sign their name with their, their dominant hand as they would normally do and then ask them to swap the pen over and sign their name with their other hand. 
And again, it's the type of thing that, you know, and obviously we're assuming here that we have you know, two um, fully, you know, well operating arms and hands here. If you haven't, you know, think about maybe crossing your legs or, or doing something that you would normally do um, and then try doing it with the, the opposite limb. Um, so if generally when we're doing things with our, our, within our preference, it feels quick and flowing and natural you don't have to think about it's kind of effortless and easy um and it, when you're doing it when it's out of preference it can feel kind of slow and awkward and, and just unnatural um you have to think and concentrate on it it takes extra thought it requires energy and also sometimes people can get the sensation of oh it just doesn't even look like my hands it's just not me it's you know <laughs> um and like I say, that's the perfect analogy that we're talking about for Myers-Briggs. It's not that you can't do it the other way. Um, it's just that it feels much more natural and easy and, and flowing. So I'm going to go through the four dimensions that we talk about in MBTI. And what we're looking for here is for you to um, let me know which of the the, the kind of the, the descriptions more closely match that feeling of yeah that's kind of more natural and easy to me um like when you you crossed your your arms mm -hmm. okay all right okay so the first um dimension that we look at is e and i introversion and extroversion this is what we've, we've already uh, touched on there's a lot of different definitions of introversion and extroversion they share similarities across the across the piece across the board but when we're talking about mbti what we're primarily focused on is your energy mm -hmm. what energizes you and what drains your energy um so somebody with a preference for extroversion they will tend to, and you'll notice that I, w I use terms like tend to rather than they will, mm -hmm. because again, it's not 100% none of these things are, but they will tend to um, prefer to talk through problems. So um, if you're working with a client, so I, I, know, I can really see this sometimes in the clients that I'm working with, because I have a couple of clients who are extroverts and they will talk and talk and talk and talk and talk in the session because mm -hmm. for them the process of exploring an issue and working it out happens externally happen you know they have to kind of talk their thoughts through as they're formulating them um they tend to learn best through doing and discussing they tend to have a breadth of interest so they will tend to say have um a large group of friends or a lot or and a large group of interests and so maybe you know i do zumba and then i also go rock climbing oh and i've joined a book club oh and i'm trying this thing this week but so they'll tend to have a, 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 a what's kind of breadth of um kind of friends and acquaintances and also of interests and they will tend to speak and act first and then reflect later as their their kind of their thought and action pattern somebody with an preference for introversion they tend to draw their energy through their internal world through quiet through reflection focusing on their thoughts and their ideas um, they prefer to think through their issues and challenges first and then tend to talk when they've they've had chance to, to think it through and reflect they learn best by reflection rather than practice um, they tend to have a smaller number of interests but much more of a depth of interest so rather than go oh i'm doing somewhere i'm doing this and i'm doing this and i'm doing that it might be i love um i'm trying to think of an example that's not related to you or i um <laughs> so maybe it's i love practicing the bass guitar and last year we actually went on a holiday to a factory where they made you know double basses because i was so interested in that that, that's actually a, a, a friend of ours who, who did that really into bass guitars that's his thing mm -hmm. um and they tend to reflect before acting and thinking so they tend to do lots of kind of thinking sometimes um 
I sometimes refer to this as you need a long runway. You need to have a lot of thinking about it before you take mm. some action on something. Um, think of it like, um, if, if, if you imagine uh, you've got a, a toy, the extrovert toy, imagine it's a, a toy robot. The extrovert robot is solar powered. So it's put away in the toy cupboard overnight and overnight it the the battery on it drains because it's there in the dark it's not getting any light it's not getting any uh, stimulation to charge its batteries up and in the morning it's brought out into the, the daylight and the daylight and the sun and the interaction with people with being played with that is what charges its battery cells and by the end of the day it's now fully charged up because it's been in the sun all day and then it goes back into the cupboard and then overnight it slowly starts to drain down the introvert robot still a great toy still equally as good equally as fun to play with however this is rechargeable battery powered so it's when it's in the toy cupboard it's plugged into the wall and those battery cells are recharged through the socket in the wall so it's it's that it's those periods of inaction where it's recharging that's what kind of charges its, its energy and then it's brought out in the morning and it's fully charged and as it's played with during the day still just as much fun as the extrovert robot it slowly starts to those battery cells slowly start to drain down until by the end of the day it needs to go back into the cupboard to be plugged into the socket to recharge so that that's one of the analogies that we use for introverts and extroverts so extroverts are they're energized by interacting with people it might be big groups, might be conversations. Um, being on their own, they tend to find draining. And this is really, uh, I think, really useful to know as a solopreneur. Because we tend to spend a lot of time on our own. Mm -hmm. And so if you are, are of an extroversion preference, you might find it really draining spending lots of extended periods of time on your own. Whereas for someone with an introverted preference, that is your recharge time. You still need interaction with people. We all do. We're humans. We all need that. But it would be the going to the networking events. It will be maybe doing workshops or doing client calls that drain your energy. And it's the those times of being on your own and being quiet and being able to kind of get on with things in, in isolation that recharges you. And so knowing this as an entrepreneur can help you to structure your day, to structure your activities and to structure your recovery time. So, for example, if you know that you have two full days where you're going to have to be working on um, maybe putting a course together and you know it's going to, you know, it's head down, I need to work on this. Or I'm doing some stuff for a client um, and I need to work on this. And I know I'm going to be working in my home office. And yeah, that, that's just how it is. But you're an extrovert. You now have some information that can help you manage that. So, for example, I know loads of people who love working in co-working spaces. Because even though they may be working solo on their own, they still need that, that being around other people, being able to go and have a chat with somebody while they're making a coffee, just knowing that there's other people around having that kind of interaction. They may want to make sure they've got events or seeing friends of an evening and uh, or talking to friends on, on the phone or making sure that they have co-working kind of virtual coffee um coffee mornings and things like that so they still have that interaction to keep them um, engaged introvert if you have a um something that's going on where you need to kind of get your head down and you're going to be on your own you you may find that no problem at all it may be when you know you're you know you have to go to the conference and it's going to be two days of networking and interacting with people you may then find that you need to build in some some ways that you can recover and manage your energy, such as, so I've got a, a friend who went to World Domination Summit and apparently there, because Chris, I can't remember, I don't know how to pronounce yeah. his name. Mm -hmm. um, apparently he's an introvert. So he has breakout chill out rooms there mm -hmm. where you can go and you can go and have some introvert recovery time in the quiet I love that I concept. Know. I remember reading about that years ago and thinking, yeah. oh, maybe that's the kind of event that I could actually yes. go to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
or you know when when i if i'm having to do a lot of traveling or i'm I'm running a workshop or something i always make sure that i have the next day blocked out in my calendar where i don't do any client calls and i don't do a lot of interaction because i need that kind of quiet time as recovery because i'm an introvert so based on what i've just said holly where which description most closely reflects your preference introvert total 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 because that was going to be my next my next question so um very sure not sure but very sure one thousand percent sure okay (laughs) very sure introvert i know this is the woman who takes herself off and goes to a hotel on her own for a weekend to write i yeah okay fair enough now This You may be, if you're listening to this, you may be thinking, well, there are times when I love spending time with people and times when I don't. That's perfectly normal. We all are a mixture of them. It's about which do you have a a preference for. So sometimes people like Holly will have a real strong preference for it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be more in the middle. If you had to choose one or the other, which would you come down on? Um... So that can sometimes help. It's also worth bearing in mind that sometimes these things are situational. So so I know people who are out and out extroverts, but there are certain groups of people that it's just like, oh no, I need to lie down for a week after spending time with them because it's, it's very taxing in other ways. Yeah. Um, if you had to choose one or the other, now remember, this is just information to help you be able to manage your energy better. Which would you choose? And if you're still not sure, then maybe experiment with it for a bit. Maybe give yourself an afternoon where you're just on your own, you're not um, interacting with people and see how you feel. Is that energizing? Is it draining? Spend some time with pe- with people if you're, you are naturally spending a lot of time on your own. Do you find that helpful? Do you find it not helpful? So it just gives you more information to be able to play with. Okay, the next one. Let me just have a sip of my water because I'm talking a lot. <laughs> I know you are. Mm. I'm just sitting here in silence and enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of the most important things is to learn, as you've said, is that there's neither good nor bad with mm. this. It's just different preferences. Yeah. It's not one thing is good and one thing is bad because mm-hmm. for most of my life, I thought that being in- an introvert was a bad thing and mm. it wasn't until just a few years ago that I realized it was just another way of being and it was totally okay. Yeah. I mean, Susan Cain's book, yeah. Quiet, is such a, if you are an introvert, or actually even if you're an extrovert and you want to understand why are they so quiet, why do they never speak, it's just rude. You know, we have so much um, cultural judgment around mm. introverts. We tend to um, favour extroverts as a, as, a, as a culture. And yep. so introverts can quite often carry around this kind of something wrong with me, I don't like parties, what's the matter, I'm really antisocial. Um, so understanding that, you know, this, this is, this is natural. This is normal. There's nothing wrong with you. And, you know, extroverts are not just, um, just being loud and brash. That's just their natural way of processing things. And extroverts, the introverts in the room, they're not just being rude or antisocial. That's just their way of processing things. I, I think this can also really help to bridge the gaps between those people that we just think, I just don't understand you at all. Mm. Um, Anyway, let's move on to the next uh, dimension. And this is S and N. And it stands for, the S stands for sensing and the N stands for intuition. Um, so this is about what kind of information you prefer to pay attention to and how you take in information. So people with a sensing preference, they they have a preference for looking and paying attention to specific information and facts to find out what is actually happening. So they are observant about what's going on around them. They are practical. They tend to be looking for the pragmatic approach to a situation. They like to focus on what's real and what's actual. So I can, can I see it? Can I touch it? Can I smell it? Um, they value practical applications. They tend to um, be factual and concrete. Uh, they notice detail. They tend to remember specifics about stuff. They tend to enjoy being in the present. They want information to be accurate and precise, and they tend to trust their own experience rather than theory. People with a preference for intuition 
they tend to focus on patterns and associations between facts rather than the facts themselves. They're interested in connections and looking for what might be and possibility rather than just focusing on the, well, what is. And so they're very good, or they tend to be very good at focusing on ideas and possibilities. Big picture. Um, tend to value imaginative insights and the abstract and theoretical. They tend to see patterns and meanings in facts. Um, they tend to enjoy thinking about and anticipating the future. And they also tend to be quite stimulated by ang- ambiguity. And they trust inspiration and that kind of, oh, I just have a good feeling about this. Um, so people with a, a sensing preference, if I held up an apple and said, tell me what you see, they would typically say, I can see an apple. It's red. It's round. It looks like it's very fresh. Um, can I smell it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It smells fresh. That. If I held that up to someone with uh, an intuition preference, they may say, oh, it's an apple. Ooh, forbidden fruit. What are you trying to tempt me with there? They will tend to link, the thought will tend to link onto something else. Um, another way of approaching this or another way of thinking about it is if, uh, if you imagine that I drew out on a piece of paper a triangle, a square and a circle. And I've drawn them in kind of a triangular shape. So we've got maybe um, square at the top, triangle in one corner, circle um, in the middle. Someone with a sensing preference would say, I see a circle, a square and a triangle. And maybe they'd notice the colour of pen that I'd used or something. Someone with an intuition preference would be more likely to see the triangle shape that those three elements were making. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is one of those that it tends to be just a little bit more, um, a little bit trickier for people to kind of uh, grasp and and decide than the the introversion, extroversion. But people with sensing preference will tend to like numbers and be good at detail and give me the facts. Don't give me some woolly theory about this. I don't care what it might be able to do. Tell me what it can do. Whereas somebody with an intuition preference may be much more likely to kind of go, okay, that's what it has done. Tell me about the possibilities for this thing. Mm-hmm. What could we do with it? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So based on what I've said, where where would you place yourself? What, what Which description most closely reflects your preference, Holly? Definitely the intuition. Mm, okay. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> I would be surprised if it, if it were, again, n- knowing you, how, how I, how I know you. Um, I wrote a book called Business Intuition. I know, so I know, I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an important part of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, with all of these, it's not that people with a sem- sensing preference don't have any intuition. And it's not that people who are very good at intuition or very in preference for intuition, we don't talk about good, um, you know, can't do data and facts and figures and things like that. We can all do all of these. Mm-hmm. It's about which comes most natural to you. So, so, so remember that bear in mind because we can, we can tend to carry around self judgments, um, about, about these things, about where we come down on them. Okay. Let's move on to the third one. The third one is T and F and it stands for thinking and feeling. Now, this is another, so I have to give my caveat about the self judgment here because this is one where people, particularly entrepreneurs in a healing profession, will have big levels of self judgment. People with a, people with a thinking preference still feel, still have empathy, still, you know, are caring. <laughs> people with a feeling preference still think, still have a brain, still have an intellect. <laughs> So it's it's not like it's one or the other. It's which comes most natural. We all do both. But let me just break them break them down. Um, and and T and F goes to how you generally will will prefer to make decisions. So whereas introversion extroversion is about your energy, and uh, uh, sensing and intuition is about your um, how you take in information. This is about how you make decisions. So. For someone with a thinking preference, they 
imagine that there's a, there's a situation that you have to make a decision about. Someone with a thinking preference is usually able to stand outside of the situation and look at it objectively from the outside in. They like to analyse the logical consequences of a choice or a situation. Tend to have consistent rules that they will apply in um, in, this, in, in situations. So if, for example, you had a manager in a workplace, they would be the type of person I treat everyone the same regardless of circumstances, because that is fairness to me. Um, like I said, they like to stand outside the situation and examine it objectively and analysing cause and effect. They tend to be guided by objective logic. They tend to focus on cause and effect. They look for flaws in logic. They tend to apply consistent principles in dealing with people. And in a, in a, a working environment, so if you're working with colleagues, if you're working with, you know, if you, you have people that you, you collaborate with or you have people on your team, um, they emphasise the involvement with the task. You know, we need to do whatever we need to do to get this thing done and out the door. Someone with a feeling preference will prefer to make decisions from an involved standpoint. So they will use empathy as their kind of first port of call. They will imagine themselves in that situation, quite often imagining well, how it is from each person in each different standpoint. So rather than that being kind of outside looking at objectively, they actually want to be inside looking at it, you know, from, from all the different standpoints. Um, they have a preference for seeking harmony. Um, they judge the importance of valuing um, difference. They will make decisions based on, on, on values, personal values and convictions. They have a focus for harmony with their own and others' values. So it might be, I want to get a win-win on this. I want us to come out with a decision where we're both happy. Um, they look for common ground and shared values. They tend to treat each person as a unique individual. So in a workplace or in a team situation, it would be, okay, I'm going to take everyone's situation into consideration. I'm not going to treat everyone the same because I recognise this isn't a level playing field we're all working on here. So, you know, if somebody has, has children and need to be a way to do the school run at a certain time, then I may offer them a more flexible working pattern than, say, somebody who doesn't, for example. Um, and in a working situation, in a team situation, they're also going to value the process over the outcome. You know, I don't care so much about whether we make this the best product ever. I want to make sure that we enjoy the journey and we get as much learning from this as possible. So based on that, do you, do you have a, you know, do, do you have a feeling of, of where your preference would be, Holly? Do I have a feeling? <laughs> Sorry, that's me looking. Okay. Yeah, where definitely, would you definitely. Place yourself. <laughs> <laughs> definitely on the F of feeling. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I, it's very interesting the way you describe that because I've just realized why when I'm online and in different online forums, I find the thinking people so annoying, like the way they just analyze everything. And I find that really hard to resonate with. And I, I just, yeah, but so interesting to understand how they're functioning because I do not function like that. Yeah. And, the, and this thing, so the, the, the people with the thinking preference, they can get really annoyed with the kind of, Oh my God, with the feelings, what's going mm -hmm. on? Yeah. Um, let's look at the practicalities here. You know, let's look at this logically and rationally in relationships. Mm -hmm. This can be really interesting. So I think a lot of time we, we, we talk about this as being gendered because I do think this is where culturally we, we kind of raise girls and boys. You know, girls are meant to be feeling, more feeling than boys. Boys are meant to be more logical and, and robust. But actually, the data and the research suggests that it, it's pretty equal between the sexes. Interesting. But we, we kind of funnel girls and boys in these different directions. You know, it's what we give people um, kind of strokes for and props for. And, you know, we reward girls for being caring. We reward, reward boys for being strong. 
Yes. And actually, th- there's no real difference between the genders. And by the way, we all have the capacity to, to do both. It's just where our most natural instinct will go to first. Mm. Well, I always say that my gut is smarter than my head. So that's, that's my feeling. So whether something feels right or doesn't feel right, because mm-hmm. when I make decisions with my head, it's not usually a mm-hmm. good result. <laughs> that is, is really quite a, an impreference thing for somebody with a, an NF preference to say. <laughs> so my, my gut is, is best at making the decisions. Um, so I, I really do want to stress this because there is a lot of baggage that people have. So say you are a coach or in a healing profession or an entrepreneur, you know, and you, you think, no, actually I have, I have a, a thinking preference. That doesn't mean you don't feel, that doesn't mean you don't care. Mm-hmm. You do. It's just your, your kind of most natural comfortable thing is to go to the, the thinking, let's be objective first and then examine, you know, so how do I feel? How might other people feel about this? Let, let's, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking empathically about this, how might people, be, you know, be, be feeling? So it's not that one is right and one that's wrong. Um, it's, they're just different. Um, so beware of that that comes up because I've I've worked with numerous women who go, but I want to be on the feeling side, <laughs> but I know mm. actually, yeah, I, I I'm 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 much more logical and rational, but I still care. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you can absolutely do both. And it's not like, you know, if you're on the feeling side, you never use logic and you're just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> let's just love everyone. It'll be fine. You know, that that's not how it works either. Okay. So the last, um, the, the last dimension that we look at is J and P, which stands for judging and perceiving. Again, this one comes with a health warning because we, uh, what we're talking about is judging, not judgmental. And a lot of people read that word as, first of all, as judgmental. We don't mean it as judgmental. It's judging versus perceiving. And this is, this looks primarily at your lifestyle and the way you kind of approach the world. Um, so people with a, a, a judging preference, not judgmental, judging preference, they have a preference for coming to closure on decisions. They prefer to live life in a, a more scheduled and orderly way. They want things to be controlled and regulated. They like tend to like making plans and then sticking to those plans until they're completed. They tend to not like open-ended things. They tend to not like um, surprises. Um, they get satisfaction from getting things done. So people with a judging preference tend to love lists and love, like, love ticking things off the lists. Like, really get pleasure from planning and um, completing tasks. They like to get things decided. They like to be scheduled and organised. They enjoy decision-making and planning. And they tend to dislike working under pressure. Um, people with a P preference, a perceiving preference... They have a preference to keeping things open-ended, a bit more loosey-goosey. They like to live life in a flexible and spontaneous way. They tend to be comfortable going with the flow and taking advantage of spontaneity and last-minute options as they arise. They um, they tend to enjoy using resourcefulness and adaptability and tend to feel a bit constrained by plans and structures. They like to keep options open. They like to be spontaneous and adaptable. They enjoy the process and they don't tend to like making a decision before they really have to make a decision. And they tend to get energized by last minute time pressures. Now, if you're working with, this is so useful to know if you work with other people or you live with other people or you're just involved with other people at all. Because J and P, people with a, a J preference and people with a P preference can really complement each other really well or they can drive each other nuts. <laughs> so imagine you like your plans. You like to be organized. You have a time scale and a structure. You like to get things done on time, actually in plenty of time. And you're working with someone with a P preference who is kind of really go with the flow and open-ended and quite enjoys last minute time pressures. And so um, we'll tend to get things in, not late, but right on the button of the deadline. Um, I, someone with a J preference can find that really stressful to work with someone like that. 
And someone with a P preference can find it really stressful to work with someone with a J preference if those plans and those um, those structures are, are, are they, they can feel very rigid to someone with a with a P preference. Um, so, Holly, knowing you as I do, <laughs> <laughs> which description more closely reflects your preference? I loved your description of this because I'd never really understood the difference between judging and perceiving until now. Ah. And I'm definitely a J mm -hmm. because I, I cannot handle working under pressure. I have to get closure on things. When I don't have closure on things, it drives me crazy. Um, I was supposed to be interviewed on someone's podcast a couple of weeks ago. The day before, the woman's um, assistant contacts me and says, she's really sorry she's got to cancel. And I was like, that's totally fine. Should I rebook? No answer. A couple of weeks later, I follow up. Hey, just checking in. Should I rebook? No answer. I am going crazy in some part of my mind. Like, this interview is not important, but I can't handle that he hasn't come back to me and said, fuck off, don't. <laughs> don't forget. like I don't care with what the answer is I just want some closure on this totally inconsequential thing <laughs> it's driving it comes into my mind like every day I'm just like just tell me to go away <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, closure is a very important thing to me. I love having a schedule. I love having everything mapped out in my Google Calendar. When I make a plan, I stick to it. I can't handle when things come up and I have to change my plans. It kills me. I love making lists. I remember being a teenager and making lists of lists that I wanted to make. Um, I... <laughs> that when they're like 16. <laughs> I had in my diary lists of lists that I wanted to make. I love planning I, and I can't handle surprises. When my husband and I first got together, my first birthday, he threw a surprise party for me. I just sat in the corner the entire time. <laughs> I was just so, I couldn't believe, I thought we were going out for dinner. All of a sudden I walk into the house and there's like 40 people there. I'm just like, what, what just happened to my life? <laughs> And it was the most beautiful thing that he did for me, but it was just my brain couldn't handle it. Oh. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, I would to say that's very uh, typical in preference, uh, Jay. Um, and this is what is one of those things that can be a real, you know, if you're a J or a P, you can use those as a real strength in your entrepreneurial business so long as you're aware of it. And you, you, you have kind of, um, strategies in place to mitigate when you have to work out a preference. So for example, one of the reasons that I think you and I, um, <laughs> collaborate so well together is I am a P. Yay. You are a J. You are the organized one of the partnership and I'm the one going, oh, we'll just wing it. <laughs> <laughs> I do the show notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll be like, oh, what do you fancy talking about today? Now, sometimes we'll have planned it. And can I just say that today, I, I think I was the slightly more organized You one. were. I totally yes. forgot. Yes. Do you know why I forgot? Because Esther in the Facebook group had proposed a topic yes. that has been on my mind for a while. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to tell Joe we're going to talk about that. I'm going to see if she wants to talk about it because that's really exciting. And I totally forgotten about you this. You were going to be spontaneous. I know. What, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, based on what you've told me, then your um, your your personal type, the one that you're deciding is the best fit for you, is an I N F J. Yay! And so, you, I did get you to do the online test before we we did our call. What was the type that that said that you were? Same thing, INFJ. Same thing, and INFJ. every time I've taken the test, it's been an INFJ, but I've never really understood it until now. Like, it's never been so clear to me why I am those four letters. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. Now, so that's what we would call a best fit. If they, they both match, brilliant. Now, if you're listening to this, you may have got a slight discrepancy between what the online thing says that you are and what you have decided through 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 listening to this so it's a couple of things that you can do on the 16 personalities uh website uh they they have a description of all of 
the different types. What we recommend that you do is you go and read the two ty- the two different types, you know, if there's a discrepancy, and then decide which do I think, knowing what I know now, is the best description of me. Now, it doesn't have to be 100% right because none of these things are. But what what by by looking at those descriptions and thinking yes that's most like me that then gives you a ton of information about well how can i then work with my type play to my strengths and then mitigate some of those areas where i have to work out of type because that's the other really important thing holly you i'm afraid will struggle to run your business as brilliantly as you do, if you now just go, well, if it's not on the calendar, I'm not doing it. And if you can't give me a decision now, I'm not doing it. And uh, yeah, I'm not using any logic anymore because I don't do logic because I'm a feeling type person. And, and joking aside, I have, I've worked with people both entrepreneurially and within an office environment where they have gone, yeah, I, I can't do that because I'm a Jane, so I need it all on the calendar and structured. I can't do any last minute things. Well, in the real world, if your yeah. website goes down or if you're having tech issues or, you know, like with me over the past couple of months, I've had to reschedule some calls because, you know, my daughter's been sick or something, then um, you, you kind of have to roll with those things. Mm. But knowing your 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 type allows you to be able to put some other things in place. Okay, I need to schedule the next meeting. So one of the things that I know is somebody who is a P, somebody who isn't naturally very scheduled, is I have to lean into that being scheduled much more. It doesn't come naturally to me. I do have um, an assistant who sometimes helps with those types of things helps me to plan out projects. Holly, you have helped me plan out projects before now. <laughs> um, because I know that's not my natural thing. I mean, in fact, the, the VA that I'm working with at the moment, what I said to her, because she says, anything else I could do? And I went, I don't know. I'm going to need you to tell me because my brain doesn't work like that. <laughs> and there will be things that I just don't even know, haven't even occurred to me. So if you could kind of, you know, give me some of your guidance, that would be brilliant. And she was like, oh, that's fantastic. Because she's obviously very organized because <laughs> most VAs tend to, to you know, to, to be on the, the, the J side of things. So it's, not, so interesting. it's not that you can't do it. It's just that you, you have to kind of think, okay, who do I know who is organized? So you might have to kind of go, okay, who do I need to talk to to kind of say, please, honey, I love you for throwing me a surprise party. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> he was so confused because he's also a huge oh. extrovert and it was all of our mutual friends and and he was just like are you okay are you enjoying this is this good and i was like yeah yeah it's, it's great it's great thank you so much um and, and you know i was the center of attention which i can't stand <laughs> i had a surprise like there were so many things that were so not aligned and and i it was just it came from such a loving place on his part and both of us were just so confused <laughs> Oh, bless him. And, and that's how you, you know, I, I think we need to negotiate going through the world. I think yeah. a lot of the problems that we have as humans trying to all exist on the same planet together is the assumption that everyone else thinks like me. And if they don't, there's something wrong with them. We may not be as avert yeah. thinking of that, but you know, but, but generally we kind of go, I've no idea why you're doing that. Are you stupid? Are you what? Are you... <laughs> why are you doing that and what the kind of my briggs approach says is that well actually everyone's doing the way that makes most sense for them mm-hmm. um you know there's there's other layers of my briggs we talk about how it affects your your stress levels and how stress tends to show and things like that that's a you know that is so in the weeds that we couldn't even cover that on a podcast i i, I don't think but um so that there are lots of different facets of it, but if we could just approach this and kind of go, okay, there's nothing wrong with me and there's nothing wrong with those people. We just do things differently. Mm-hmm. How can we have a conversation then from that point of understanding that we are different, not trying to deliberately, you know, pee sabotage each other. Each other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then it becomes a lot easier. Then you can have the conversation with the, you know, the extroverted husband <laughs> to say, 
of course we can go so one thing susan kane talks about in in her book um quiet is having you know kind of like get out clauses okay of course we can go to the party and we will go and socialize but please don't be upset when i leave after an hour Mm -hmm. so then everyone is kind of on the same page it's like i will go and then when i have used my my introvert time up my kind of my people credits then i will go or if you are um an, an introvert and your partner's an extrovert then then you know sometimes yeah you're gonna have to leave the house and you're gonna have to do some of those sociable things because your partner who's the extrovert they need that that's their fuel as well um so unless you want to live a totally separate life where you don't do anything together then there are areas where you're gonna have to lean into that i'm gonna have to spend time i'm gonna go to a party but maybe i i allow myself some recovery time afterwards or maybe i i do spend an hour hanging out in the kitchen just having a one-on-one conversation with somebody um until i've kind of recouped some of my energy and i can go back out into the the thrall there should be like myers-briggs dating apps or something oh, for sure yeah i'm sure there are <laughs> there probably are yeah it's, it's probably one that, that they've done out there i am super aware that this is now getting on for quite a, a long episode so at any have you got any other any other questions or anything else that you want to say holly about this? no i I found this incredibly useful because despite the fact that I knew what my letters were, I never fully understood it until today. So I think this was incredibly useful for me and I hope that the listeners agree because it's, I just think that anything we can do to understand ourselves better helps us to just live a better life and to work with our clients better and to engage with other people better. And it's just, it's just part of becoming self aware of who we are, how we are, and how we function in the world. So I think this is just really important stuff. I mean, I'd love it. I mean, you can tell from my voice, I'm like, I'm a nerd <laughs> heaven with this stuff. Um, but and I agree. It helps us to understand ourselves. And it helps us to understand one another from a very respectful place of, okay, we're different. So how do we, how do we then manage these differences? How do we uh, work together rather than kind of going, I am this type and you are that type and the two of us will never mix and never do anything you know that is that is where you get into the kind of you're just putting people in boxes and what's the point of that um it is about how can we foster understanding of ourselves and uh of one another and that that's why i i love it so much but and i think that's also why this kind of the second half of the evaluation where you're actually speaking with another human being yes. is so important because mm-hmm. it helps you understand not just how you function but how the other group functions yeah. as well mm-hmm. oh yeah when i run this in a workshop which i i, I don't do so much anymore but it tends to be something that i did a lot more when i had a, had a day job we kind of break people off into groups depending on the which which type they are which side of the preference of, of one of the the areas they are and you know having the two different groups see how differently mm-hmm. people respond so there's one where we have uh we break off the j's and the p's <laughs> and we say okay here's a piece of flip chop paper you're going to uh, show me how you get ready to, you're planning a holiday you're, you're going to go on holiday what do you do and the jays got so excited and they're all fighting over the pen and they're making lists <laughs> and they're kind of and you know it, it's it's things like which you, you may be able to relate to, I don't know. So I start planning it six months before. I have all of my clothes <laughs> co- colour coded in, you know, I have a spreadsheet, blah, blah, blah. And the peas are stood there going, I don't even understand the question. What what do you mean? <laughs> um, I decide where I'm going. I show up at the airport. And there's stories of things like, oh, once I showed up at the airport and I realised I hadn't packed any clothes for my second daughter, but it was fine. We bought a thing so it was out there. <laughs> and the J's are doubled over with just the anxiety at the thought of it. <laughs> Um, so it's really good fun, but a, a good way of uh, just illustrating, you know, people do things differently. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that, you know, they're just trying to deliberately ruin your life. <laughs> they're just really different. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank love you it, for love letting it. me experiment on you. I enjoy Thank this. you for playing with Myers-Briggs. <laughs> You are so welcome. And if you're listening to this and you have any questions or uh, obviously we'll put the link to the um, yes. 16 personalities site and a bit of stuff about Myers-Briggs in the, in the show notes and stuff. But if you do have any, any particular questions, then you can drop me a line, joe at joecasey.com and holly at hollywarton.com. 
Yeah, but don't email me because you're the expert on this. This is true. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can email me to talk about INFJ stuff. <laughs> okay, yeah, and lists. And uh, the lists, the lists, lists that you want to make. That cracks me up. That's a very J thing to say. <laughs> can I tell you, uh, just before we finish, the most yes. embarrassing thing that ever happened to me in a training room? So, um, yes, I know the story. I love it. Okay. I love it. <laughs> so I was, I was lots and lots of ideas and we were kind of, uh, I was bouncing ideas off with one of the, the delegates. There's a room, like 20 odd people in the room. And, uh, we're talking about that. My partner who I was co-training with, co-delivering with that he was very J and he was like, we need to get back on track. And I was like, Oh no, I'm so sorry. I'm getting so excited. I've just wanted to do this now. That's the penis in me. <laughs> <laughs> meaning the p as in perceiving ness <laughs> in me but of course when you say that fast that that's not what it sounds like at all <laughs> that's the penis in me <laughs> yeah i never looked at that <laughs> <laughs> oh, i love that story <laughs> i think we should end it there yes i think we should <laughs> so please drop me a line and let me know what you thought about this week's episode Email me at holly at hollywharton.com or find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram and get in touch. I would love to hear from you. And thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a quick review on iTunes. It would mean the world to me. Remember to visit hollywharton.com forward slash 242 for the show notes on this episode, including links to some of the things that we talked about. And I'll be back next week with another solo episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a beautiful day. Thank you so much for listening to the Business Mindset Podcast. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for the topics that were discussed at hollywharton.com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and learn more about business mindset, join my private community for entrepreneurs at hollywharton.com forward slash group that will redirect you to the Facebook group. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to head over to iTunes and leave a quick review of this podcast. It just takes a minute. Thank you so much.